All right, guys. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, so we're ready to get started now here on the Group IB side. Uh, so my name is Nicholas Palmer. Um, I'm responsible for the international relations at Group IB, and I'm joined here also by uh, my colleague and co-founder of Group IB, Dmitry Volkov. Hello, General. Uh, so Dmitry leads up our threat intelligence division at Group IB, um, and we wanted to host today's webinar after a series of, of questions uh, following the re report that we released uh, covering uh, Cobalt's group. Uh, who were responsible for a number of ATM uh, jackpotting incidents around the world, and they've been targeting banks actively since the beginning of August uh, 2016. Uh, so during today's webinar, we wanted to give you an, a summary overview of the, of the case uh, and go into a little bit more depth uh, of what we saw from this particular group uh, from the report as well. Uh, any connections to existing criminal groups that we s hypothesize for this particular group, and also allow the opportunity for any types of uh, question and answer that you want to give. So I'll kind of be watching on the on the right hand side. If so, if you have questions as we go through, uh, please feel free to to type them in, um, and and I'll get to them at the appropriate time. Um, yeah, so let me just hide this screen a little bit and I'll carefully uh, watch for questions as well. Um, so firstly, let's kind of have just a summary overview of some of the attack methods that we see for, uh, from criminals attacking ATM uh, systems. Uh, naturally, we have uh, skimming of uh, the magnetic strip from the cards, uh, sh stealing of the um, actual physical uh, chip card from, from shimming operations. There's more YouTube-friendly uh, physical attack methodologies uh, whereby criminal, criminals actually get into the ATM casings and, and conduct other types of attacks. Uh, cash trapping and, and card trapping, leaving of the, uh, the cash and the card within the ATMs. Uh, but today, of course, let's focus our attention on the lo logical attack methodologies uh, that were employed by the uh, Cobalt group. So on the logical attacks of, of ATM sites, they're, they're really broken up into uh, three different uh, categories. So uh, they can be broken up into transaction reversal frauds, um, when uh, also physical access where criminals get access to the ATMs. Uh, and this can include you know, fake card processing, uh, black boxing actually, which we've seen uh, quite a lot of from Russian speaking cyber criminal groups. Uh, the use of black box uh, after gaining physical access to the ATM uh, casing. Um, there's actually a Russian-speaking cyber criminal group that leaves a sticker as a signature, a uh, picture of a, uh, of a bear uh, as their signature after they gain access to the ATM system. Also physical access with Trojans as well, but again, let's focus our attention on uh, logical attacks and, and really targeted attacks to gain control over ATM systems. Uh, which was really covered uh, by the by the Cobalt group. Um, so before we move into the methodology of the Cobalt group, let's look at the the time map in more detail and some of the connection that we see to some of the other uh, Russian-speaking cyber criminal groups uh, leading up to the series of, of Cobalt attacks. So, as you recall, uh, before the Swift attacks took place, uh, a group dubbed uh, Bootrap was responsible for conducting. Uh, over 13 targeted attacks on financial institutions against uh, Russian uh, banks. Uh, now this group's MO was really to, to conduct targeted attacks on financial institutions and they searched for the automated workstations of the central bank and this is the uh, system in Russia responsible for interbank uh, transfers, so bank-to-bank -bank transfers, much like the SWIFT system. Uh, and this group was responsible for over 25 million dollars uh, of attacks against uh, banks in Russia. So, as we know from our experience in general, Russian-speaking cyber criminals typically use Russia as a testing ground before moving on to uh, to, to conduct attacks in other countries. Um, so, in, in March of this year, as you see on the screen here, we have the last confirmed attack uh, from the Bootrap group. Uh, two months after this period, there were a number of arrests, uh, arrests of the Bootrap group uh, responsible for the money laundering operations uh, that were acquired during this particular attack. Now, although there were a number of arrests, uh, it is believed that not all members within the Bootrap gang uh, were arrested. Uh, 
So in, in June of 2016, we recorded the first attack of, of Cobalt's, Cobalt against a Russian bank uh, using Cobalt Strike. Um, and this, you know, after this confirmation was followed by an extremely active uh, July with attacks on banks in Armenia, Belarus, Poland, and Germany. Um, and again, so in, in August, we saw a number of different attacks uh, in Eastern European countries, but also in the UK and the Netherlands, uh, Malaysia, etc. In September, we continued to see attacks against um, ATM systems in Russian financial institutions. And we have uncovered more information to identify further actions of this group continuing just up until uh, this last week. Uh, their attack targets have extended to uh, South America, targeting some banks in Brazil. Uh, so they're definitely not limiting their attention to uh, only uh, the EU and, and some other countries. So now that we have you know, a basic understanding of the uh, criminal group and some of the timelines around that, uh, let's look at their you know, activities and their attack scheme at, at a basic sense, at a, at a basic methodology. Um, so really we can break their methodology up into six different steps in their operation. Uh, the first step is initial infection. Uh, and really, in every case that we saw, a targeted uh, spear phishing email was used um, with various exploits, uh, a number of different malicious attachments. We're going to show you those in more detail uh, today. But that was always the uh, initial attack vector was spear phishing emails in every case that we saw. Uh, following the uh, initial infection, their uh, next tactic was to gain remote access, so using uh, rat tools to gain control over the network. Uh, from there, um, you know, after they have control over the network, their uh, step three really was to gain additional privileges. And through the, the course of today's presentation, you'll understand, and I think you have already from our report, that in, in all cases, the, the tools that they used uh, were publicly available tools. So in the gaining uh, privileges, they used uh, Mimikatz to, to escalate their, their privileges. So after step three, uh, step four is data collection. So the cyber criminal group would look for uh, computers with access to critical systems. Um, in Cobalt's case, uh, this was the ATM control systems, the isolated portion of the bank's networks uh, responsible for the ATM systems. But obviously, um, you know, through this process and up until this stage, this type of attack methodology can be used for other critical infrastructure within the banks. Uh, so it's important to note that it's not only the uh, the ATM systems at risk. Sorry, I'm just pausing here. I think there is a question from the group. Um, so, so I think we need some approval for another uh, member. So just give me one second. Maybe we can have. Uh, to, maybe if you can ask Virginia to approve this individual. So just give us a second, guys. We've uh, had some requests for approval uh, to the webinar. So Dimitri's gone to try to get that organized for you. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So excuse me. Um, so a after step four uh, and data collection, uh, after criminals identified the systems of interest, uh, step five was to uh, conduct their attacks on ATM. So with administrative privileges, uh, the criminals could really monitor the activity of the bank's operations and, and perform the same actions to attack uh, the ATM systems. So step six, at, at a general high level sense, again, we'll go into all of the methodology in more detail, but in, in every case that we investigated, the investigation process was complicated. Uh, criminals used S-Delete and other uh, deletion methodology to uh, remove traces of their existing within, their, uh, within the uh, bank's network and to really muddy the waters for uh, investigative, forensics investigative capabilities. So I, I'm not an artist, so excuse me for my crude drawing, but uh, through the Russian-speaking webinar that we had, we found that a, a, a general infographic uh, outlining uh, the previous section that we had into an, an, an infographic was very helpful for uh, the webinar. So let's look at this very crude drawing of the bank's corporate network um, and talk about um, 
basically the methodology in uh, in more detail again. So it, if you look on the left hand side, obviously the, the criminal group here always used a series of different spear phishing emails to gain initial as access to basically any user segment within the, the bank's corporate network. They weren't after anything in specific, just rather to gain an entry point. It could, could be anything. Um, you know, from, from there, they really focused on increasing their privileges um, after they had access to an endpoint within a user segment. They'd really begin their offensive actions of privilege, privilege escalation uh, within the network to really hunt for admin access. And, and they did this mostly in, in the domain controllers. So we'll go over this in, in more detail as well. So once they had admin access to, to the network segment, uh, they consolidated control uh, over the local network and isolated uh, access, isolated ATM networks. Uh, basically, they created a, a tunnel system from in, infected endpoints in the user segment to uh, isolated segments here, such as the ATM networks. And they did this, did this over uh, private channels like HTTPS and HTTP to avoid detection from uh, the isolated uh, network and then conduct their attacks. So let's look uh, now at some of the different spear phishing uh, emails that were used to gain entry. Um, so for the Russian-speaking banking segment, uh, the criminals used uh, naturally uh, Russian language text uh, from a variety of different acting as sources. Uh, for this particular spear phishing email targeting the Russian banking segment, uh, there was a malicious um, exploit here in a, in a zip file. And obviously, uh, for this particular tactic, they had the file um, password control, so you can hear you can see here parol na arif, um, and so this particular file had a password protected uh, with the password bank. Um, so that was the the phishing email for the the Russian segment. Um, so let's look at another one more for the European market. I think everyone will remember this from the uh, report, but for phishing attacks in other countries, they used the rules for European banks dot doc um, and also Bitcoin ATMs dot doc. Uh, these were really the most widely distributed doc documents sent acting as the European Central Bank in August of 2016. Now this was the, the same group, however, employed different techniques to, to challenge a more well-protected uh, network. So in this particular spear phishing email, the email attachments contained malicious RTF exploits um, and they exploited the CVE 2015-1641 uh, vulnerability. Um, you know, that, that said, criminals used a, a standard shell code generated uh, by such penetration testing tools as Metasploit and Cobalt Strike. So, in addition to sending emails acting as the central bank, uh, the Cobalt Group also were cheeky enough to uh, use the brand of some ATM manufacturers uh, as a cover for legitimacy. So, on the right hand side of my screen, you can see the Russian speaking um, spear phishing email with malicious word attachment um, sent on behalf of Diebold uh, Nixdorf here. Um, and really to target uh, more European financial institutions, on the left hand side you can see that the uh, cyber criminals actually used the um, legitimate uh, winkorf-nixdorf.com domain. So they configured uh, their email servers to send this email and bypass anti-spam solutions with the legitimate domain uh, just to uh, beat more uh, mature uh, financial institutions. Uh, in, a, in addition to uh, these spear phishing emails, the uh, criminal group also sent uh, emails acting as um, banking software providers such as CTF. Um, and in this particular spear phishing emails, they sent a file with malicious macros. So you can see here, uh, you know, just a screenshot of the email. Um, and the ask to enable macros from that. It's important to note that unlike Anunak and Bootrap groups, the documents attached in, in this particular file didn't actually contain 
uh, any textual content uh, to look out for. Um, so that's kind of a summary of, of the phishing emails that were used. Dimitri, do you have any comments about the initial attack vector for spear phishing emails? Yes, thank you, Nick. Uh, I just want to add uh, one thing that uh, Cobalt Strike group that uh, use Cobalt Strike tool, uh, we do we work very, I would say we do very dirty job. Uh, the document don't have any textual content. We use very simple techniques to create uh, malicious attachments. And uh, there are several examples we need to describe pretty well, but I would like to focus on some differences. So when, on the first example, let me scroll uh, up. Uh, on this example, the main focus that we use to send the only executable files in hierarchy. So very simple technique that allows you to bypass some antivirus and the spam solution because the password with binary files, sorry, but the archive with binary file is a password protected. That's why some of the bank uh, security system uh, will block this email because uh, uh, every archive with password should be uh, quarantined, for instance, or, or blocked. But some of them uh, will allow it to deliver to the end user. Uh, if we understand that the campaign was not very, uh, very effective, we start to send uh, not executables in archive, but start to send the documents uh, with an exploit. Uh, if we understand that exploits uh, detected by corporate security solutions also uh, very well, we start to send a little bit other spear phishing email. For instance, in the first one in ninkofnixdorf.com, we use official domain name uh, because, uh, as you, you all, all of you know, uh, mail protocols allow you to to fake the sender's email address. So in this case, the email address is uh, really um, existing email address, and then the attachment will be a malicious document. And if you understand that and spam solution block uh, this fake email with really existing uh, email address but send not from our email server. We create their own uh, email server. We register their own domain name and configure email server to, uh, to uh, bypass these security checks where they're usually done by uh, anti-spam solutions, for instance. If the domain name really exists, if the uh, sender email really exists, and if uh, email has been sent really was sent from this domain. And of course, in case of Binko next door, uh, all these security checks will not be passed. But in case of dbol.pw domain name, all the security checks will be passed successfully. And if we understand that no one uh, of mentioned methods was successful, only in this case we start to send uh, spare efficient with uh, uh, documents with markers. So we use, we really use uh, different techniques, but uh, very si simple. And uh, the tools we use to create these documents are also easy to use and easy to detect. So I would say the spear phishing campaign is pretty dirty. Uh, but uh, even in this case, we were really successful uh, to get access inside the corporate networks of uh, uh, biggest banks and actually usually we were successful in some small regional uh, divisions. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point as well. Um, you know, from the activities that we've seen, obviously there was uh, larger financial institutions that were targeted, but in recent evidence that we've found, uh, some of the more regional uh, financial institutions of these larger organizations have been targeted. Uh, hopefully to you know exploit a little bit more lax security methodologies. So now that we've gone through kind of the initial infection vector, I'll stop there and, and take any questions just for a minute if there are any from the group uh, before we move on to how the malware was uh, survivable within the network.
All right. Yeah, I'll hide this a bit so everyone can see. Uh, all right, so now that we have an understanding of, of how Cobalt Group entered the corporate networks, let's look at more into how the malware survived within the banking infrastructure. Uh, so one of the key features of the malware was that once exploited, it only operated within the memory and was not actually saved uh, on the file disk. Uh, so that was one of the uh, critical points about this. And of course, this was to avoid any type of antivirus scans, uh, et cetera, which in all ca cases that we investigated, antivirus was unable to detect uh, evidence of, of Cobalt Strike. One of the other uh, ways that uh, Cobalt was survivable within the corporate network um, was to be run on the auto start. So what uh, Cobalt Group did was actually identify on the infected endpoints what particular legitimate applications were in the auto run process and they actually replaced these legitimate executables with that of uh, the Cobalt executable. So that was one way uh, that they survived within the network. Uh, the other method that they used uh, was that they would actually create a task in Windows Task Scheduler to relaunch the malicious files at a certain period of time uh, in order to uh, relaunch the, the exploit in the event that it was, uh, you know, restarted system or removed from the network, etc. Uh, so that was two, two of the different ways uh, that Cobalt Group used to survive within uh, the corporate network. I think Dimitri has a point as well. Yes, and when we talk about Windows Task Scheduler, uh, the interesting thing that there is, again, there is no any malicious files on the disk. That's why when uh, someone is doing internet, uh, incident response, they try to identify these files, they'll find nothing uh, with uh, any specific uh, crafted tools or virus, standard antivirus solutions. So that's why it's critically important to check what is the what task uh, are inside of Windows Task Scheduler. Mm -hmm. So it helps a lot uh, to identify uh, the distribution points or update points that will be used by an attacker. Because we can, we can create a task that will download malicious files again inside of corporate network, maybe 20 days later, maybe mm -hmm. one month later. Uh, that's why. If you don't clean the schedule task, uh, the Windows task scheduler, uh, the incident would repeat uh, some sometime later. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a great point from Dimitri, and this is one of the key things that you should be on the lookout uh, for for traces of cobalt. Um, so let's let's move on from the uh, malware survivability and look more into how uh, the cobalt group actually increased or escalated their privileges within the corporate network. Um, really, really to to do this, um, they search for group policy uh, preferences uh, and specifically the groups.xml uh, file um, within GPP. So they, they searched the, the system that they had uh, to see if groups.xml was actually put there by an administrator at some point in time. Um, if they found this particular file, naturally it's going to be uh, encrypted, you know, AES-256 algorithm and Base64 encoding. Uh, but if found, this particular decryption code is actually available uh, on the Microsoft website. Um, so this is, is, is another sign if someone is, you know, searching for this particular uh, type of, of file within the network, it's, it's a sign that, uh, you know, they're active there. Um, and you can see here the, the publicly available, available decryption code uh, here. Uh, another, another methodology that they used uh, to escalate privileges um, is, is to use Mimikatz. So if the, if the attacker had local root privileges without access to the domain controller, the attackers actually connected to workstations and servers in order to find a user uh, with access to the domain controller. If they, if they had access to the domain controller, they could simply uh, use Mimikatz to display every single uh, user credential that was logged into the domain controller at that particular time. It was easy as using that right there. Um, if they didn't have uh, local administrator rights, what they would do is, is exploit, uh, use different exploits to gain access to different systems um, and try to identify uh, a device with uh, different uh, administration credentials. Uh, so they, again, you can find these in a report, but use different um, vulnerabilities to uh, get system level privileges in X32 and, and 64 operating systems. 
Um, I think Dimitri has a point. Go ahead. Yes, thanks, uh, yeah. Nick. Uh, and if the system is not vulnerable to the uh, vulnerabilities that you mentioned uh, or regarding to CE uh, of 2014, 2015, or 2016, yes, uh, we tried to connect to another host. And we are looking for the host inside the corporate network that is vulnerable. So that's why the patch management is, of course, you're aware of that. It's a critical procedure. But uh, I would say, in most of cases, when we are not successfully get uh, access to a domain controller, we were always able to find one machine uh, that is one, uh, have a ability to be exploit, uh, exploited to local privilege escalations to get access of a uh, local administrator and to be able to launch mini cards to find uh, another computers with uh, uh, raised uh, privileges and of course to find the main controller. Sure, and uh, l let's talk a little bit about uh, Mimikatz Golden Ticket. So, although we didn't identify this methodology used by Cobalt, we, we do fully believe that this could be exploited in future attacks. So, the technique to uh, obtain a Golden Ticket is, is really to access the Active Directory, uh, which contains uh, the Key Distribution Center Service account. Uh, with access to a domain controller, the, the attackers can copy the entire Active Directory uh, database, for example, by running the command mimicats.exe privilege debug, and actually get and extract the NTLM uh, hash from this particular account. Now, with this particular uh, hash and domain idea, the criminals can use mimicats to then create a, a golden ticket, uh, giving them access to any uh, domain excuse me, any record uh, within the domain. So while we didn't see this used naturally, it is something that you should be aware of uh, and, and to look for in, in future incidents. So now that we have an understanding of how they increase their, their privileges, um, we wanted to also sh show you some of the tools that they used uh, for sh searching uh, for different systems of interest within the corporate network. So they used four different uh, tool sets. They used NetScan uh, to search for different uh, computers of, of interest, obviously a, a legitimate tool as well. Uh, but one of the particular tools that Cobalt Group used that uh, is definitely a key indicator for everyone to, to search for uh, for signs of this particular activity is, is uh, patch86.exe. Uh, so uh, this is used to, to turn an endpoint uh, within the network into a terminal server uh, to support simultaneous uh, users, obviously a, a critical component of this particular attack uh, by Cobalt Group, uh, but something that you all can use to, to search for this activity within your network. And obviously if you find this activity, uh, it's, a, it's a clear indicator of, of their activity within your network. I think that. All right, so now that, that criminals had appropriate access to the systems uh, they require, let's look at how they consolidated control uh, over the lo local network. And I think you can, you can see most of it, but let me just get my screen uh, over here. So again, in, in all the cases that we analyzed, the uh, cyber criminal group used legitimate tools, le legitimate ro remote access tool in, in the cases that we identified team viewer, ME admin, etc. but anything can be utilized. Um, they launched a, a beacon version of Cobalt Strike uh, onto a host with access to the internet. So those were you know, typically the, the initially infected uh, endpoints within the network. Um, to, to do uh, now, one of the, obviously the critical components here is, is how they communicated with what we called in, in our report the slave nodes uh, or the endpoints within the isolated network such as the ATM system. Um, to, to basically communicate with these particular systems, uh, they launched a beacon uh, version of Cobalt Strike uh, with access to the internet on these particular master nodes. And when they did so, they actually communicated with CNC servers but did, did so through hidden channels. Uh, like DNS, HTTP, and HTTPS to avoid detection from traditional IPS and IDS sensors. Uh, so this was a critical component uh, for them as well. Um, I 
Any, anything else? There? I'm alright. Yeah. Sorry. Nothing else. Okay. So, what particular uh, software did they use uh, now that criminals had access to ATM systems? How did they instruct uh, ATMs to spit out cash? Uh, in, in the cases that we investigated, the COBOL group actually developed a, a tool for XFS uh, interface that allowed the criminals to uh, use the API in order to connect to the ATM and dispense and send commands to deplete cash cassettes. Um, now, in general, it operated in accordance with the arguments that are transmitted at startup for ATMs. Um, and in total, uh, there are five arguments, and the value for each of them were specified by the remote op operator of COBOL Group, so we listed them all here. Now, if the arguments were correctly transferred, a message with the parameters of further actions uh, was displayed, uh, which you can see uh, at the bottom of my page here. So, following this, the, the program actually produces a number of standard actions that should be performed before uh, cash dispenses. If they were su successful, the ATM actually uh, gave out cash to the mule. And this operation was, of course, uh, repeated as many times as in the dispense count uh, argument. Now, one interesting point to make is that the criminal group actually didn't hide the source code of the malware. Uh, they didn't protect it, which uh, really simplified its analysis. But what we believe is that an assumption can be made that the author of this particular uh, malware didn't actually plan for its distribution and thus could, you know, be a member of the attack group uh, itself. Anything to add on the teams? Okay. So now that uh, the criminals actually depleted the cash, uh, they began to delete their traces. Uh, and to do so, they launched S-Delete program, um, which basically designed to delete files in a special manner and making it impossible to recover them uh, through a forensics investigation. Uh, so that was one thing that they always did uh, to complicate uh, the forensics investigation. Uh, additionally, to control uh, the money mules and identify exactly how much money uh, was depleted at each ATM, the organizer used a special log file, uh, disp.txt, uh, with information on the exact number of bank notes, notes that were dispensed at ATM cassettes. Uh, so those were two of the things that the criminal group did uh, post. Uh, jackpotting of the ATMs. So, uh, how do we typically see uh, attacks on ATMs? What do the organizations uh, look like? So, you know, at the top of, of any organization, we have the attack organizer, uh, typically one or, or two individuals uh, that is creating uh, the scheme, that is organizing the scheme, hiring the different operators. Um, and in Cobalt's case, based on the number of different incidents that we saw in the short period of time, we do believe that there were uh, more than one operators uh, that were conducting the activities. Generally, they didn't have an understanding potentially of, of exactly what operation they were conducting, uh, but operated the central uh, Cobalt Strike console. Uh, they, of course, had no contact between uh, the operators and the mules. Um, and on the cash out side, we typically have the, the cash out organizer who organizes with the money mules exactly where to go, what ATMs to hit at certain periods of time, um, and basically to, to walk and, and hit the ATMs. If we, you know, it, it is interesting to note to look at the different uh, countries that were hit initially. Uh, these are countries that are often frequently frequented by uh, Russian-speaking individuals uh, for vacation purposes, so they can fly in and out to Thailand, for example, Malaysia, and other places. Uh, conduct their mule operations and, and head back home uh, to, to Russia. Uh, so that's typically how we see the, the attack on ATM. So how did we detect uh, this activity? There was a, a number of different ways that we detected it, but basically in, in June of 2006, uh, we detected the first spear phishing emails targeting uh, financial institution clients in Russia. Um, from there, we basically have three different methodologies to uh, uncover further incidents of this. So we have, if, if you don't already know, at Group IB, we have a product called uh, TDS 
This is our IDS system, which we have at ISP level, but also installed within our corporate clients' networks. So we then monitored for additional incidents of Cobalt Strike uh, within our clients' uh, corporate networks and also at ISP level. From incident response, uh, we conducted a number of different incident responses, both in Russia uh, and abroad, uh, to identify further incidents of Cobalt Strike. And of course, coordination with uh, our data exchange. So we co cooperate with other vendors around the world and different global uh, data exchange programs to confirm activity that we see here in Russia, uh, also connected to different uh, countries around the world. So of course, uh, can we all prevent this? Um, you know, I think during today's presentation, we identified a number of different signs that you should search for. Uh, we believe that this specific type of attack can be detected at a number of different levels, uh, from initial infection to uh, attempts to escalate privileges on the network. So I think there are different levels that you're able to detect uh, specific activities of Cobalt Group. Um, in addition to that, obviously, uh, intelligence, looking for different indicators of compromise that we have within the report. So this is publicly available, but if you haven't received a copy, we can share that with you. Uh, so looking for different signs of that. Uh, analysis, analyzing suspicious, uh, suspicious files. So all of the files that we identified for you, you should be looking for traces of those within your sandbox and environment as well. Um, and you can also send us any suspicious files that you see uh, for analysis. So, so here on the left hand side you can see intelligence at groupib.ru. We do encourage you to send us any type of suspicious files that you see that may be connected to this particular group. We'll analyze them for you and provide a full report on, and remediation efforts as well. Um, and also any type of uh, IDS sensor and IPS sensor with knowledge of this particular type of attack from your threat intelligence data uh, could be a critical methodology to detect against this particular type of event. So that's it from, from our end. Uh, we'd like to open up now to the people within the webinar uh, to see if you have any questions or comments and Dimitri and I would be happy to address those now. So we'll pause here and, and take any questions that you may have. So Dimitri and I actually uh, are using GoToMeeting for, uh, oh, there we, there we are. Yeah, so if you have questions, feel free to uh, type them in the, the chat box on the lower uh, right-hand side. Yeah, there we are. So the first question that we have is, how can we detect remote control traffic? Uh, well, everything depends on type of network traffic. Uh, usually, uh, some, actually, sometimes we use TeamViewer and ME Admin. And uh, TeamViewer and ME Admin tools have a central service with uh, redirect traffic to proper hosts. So that's why if you see with some someone trying to reach uh, domain names in TeamViewer domain or any admin official domain, it means that someone is trying to establish a remote connection using these tools. But sometimes we are special crafted uh, um, 
tools, uh, for instance, uh, like Hyden BNC or Cobalt Strike has uh, its own remote administration uh, protocol. In this case, you need some specific tools uh, like maybe IDS or any other solutions that are able to analyze network suspicious network traffic automatically and provide you alerts. Uh, so everything depends on case, of course. I hope I answered the question. So I think there's a few other questions. Let's go here. Do, 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 do. All right. So the next question, in the attacks, did the ATMs have any sort of endpoint protection software installed? Specifically, I'm referring to whitelisting type of protection. Uh, actually, no, uh, because uh, the tool that we use to, in, to dispense the money from ATM machine uh, creates the process, additional process. That's why we are unable to have, uh, bypass uh, whitelisting. So that's why on, in real incidents, uh, nothing special that, uh, I mean, integrity control or process whitelisting uh, software was not used. So I think there, there are a couple of other questions, so we'll continue to wait, um, and please feel free to, to type them in. So the next question that we have, how are they able to decrypt AES-256 key regarding credential stealing phase. If I understood, they found hashed password inside the group policy preferences files. No, you, you okay. uh, Well, everything is simple. Uh, when you, yes, we found uh, encrypted password uh, in group policy XML file. And this password is always encrypted. Uh, by default, it, it encrypted with uh, standard, uh, standard IS key that is publicly available on Microsoft MSDN uh, portal. So everyone can decrypt it because everyone is now the key. So we've had a request for the uh, presentation. We can certainly send this out for everyone uh, after the presentation. You're very welcome. So we'll hold on for, for a couple more minutes uh, and see if there are any questions, but if, uh, if the other attendees would, would like to jump off, we'd just like to say thank you very much uh, for, for joining our webinar. If you have follow-up questions that you didn't want to ask uh, during the webinar, uh, you can do so privately uh, by contacting myself. So my email is palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R, at group-ib.com, uh, and Dimitri and I will develop a response for you. So thank you guys very much. We'll wait for any further questions from the audience. Um, All right, guys, so we'll conclude the webinar there. Thank you all very much for your time today. Uh, we hope that you learned a little bit more about uh, the Cobalt Group. And again, uh, please feel free to send uh, your questions to my email, and Dimitri and I will develop a response for you. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Goodbye.